this is David Fry from My Grazing. Uh, welcome to the Wool Growing Data Dive webinar uh, presented by My Grazing and Marina Mick. Uh, today we'll be hearing from Bart Davison, agronomist and My Grazing co-founder. As a consultant for over 15 years, Bart's worked across a diverse range of uh, farming operations. He applies a, a system-based approach, uh, relying on principles to work with and train land managers in development of uh, reporting to farm management plans. Bart's experience spans throughout the agricultural sector from low input certified organic systems through to high input intensive dairy and irrigated cotton and, and grains. Um, Bart's uh, presented to thousands of graziers over the past few years at live events across Australia and the US. He's also been featured on uh, a fair few podcasts as well. We're also lucky to have uh, Will Rag from Cabin Station. He'll cover the, the practical application of some of the, the theory that Bart will discuss. Uh, so now I'll hand over to Bart. Good. Uh, I'd like to know who wrote that wonderful introduction. It was very nice. <laughs> uh, okay. Welcome, folks. Uh, thanks for having us. This, um, this little initiative was really uh, just an idea that came out of discussions with Merino Link. <clears throat> Uh, following some earlier uh, presentations that arose out of drought, which, uh, funnily enough, we're, we're all still going through sometime later and <clears throat> becoming all too familiar with. So um, just to, to introduce where we're going, what we're doing, um, in essence, uh, I'd like to thank Jason Lexford, CEO of Marina Link, for making this possible, getting us going. Uh, Matt Crozier and the team at Cabin Station for... Uh, really making it easy to, to work with the data and actually start to look at um, what's happening on actual properties with actual animals and gaining some insights through that. And the very many other uh, wool growers in Maya that uh, volunteered QuickSmart to help me out with this uh, data dive. And I really do appreciate the number of people that put their hands up to, uh, to help me with that. So that was fantastic. <clears throat> uh, very quickly, you know, Marina Link would be obvious to those on the on the call now because um, that's how you found us. So in terms of those that haven't ever come across Maya, we're a software company. We're all about grazing management, utterly focused on on uh, the interplay between animals, land, people, rainfall, pasture, and uh, and the results that arise from that. Um, we're agnostic. In the, in the big broad church of wool, uh, which I've found at various times can be a hornet's nest, although uh, an enjoyable one. <laughs> but um, we're coming at this from the, from the data position. We're coming at this from what does the data tell us, uh, pure and simple. What's the experience that's coming through the numbers from the many <clears throat> uh, people, animals, paddocks, properties, and so on that, um, that we work with. Uh, in collaboration. So all of which is focused on the grazing management. And in this context, we're pretty interested in the wool production for obvious reasons uh, for Marino Link. So without further ado, um, let's see if I can get my screen to move. Yeah, okay. So um, we've, got a, we've got an accruing database where very quickly <clears throat> over a few years now, accruing a data set that is giving us a lot of insight into grazing management. That's really what, what this is about and trying to look at that through the perspective of uh, wool and sheep today. Uh, so that, that little diagram on the left is, is showing a dot per paddock with, uh, with a crude grass yield over time. And uh, it's, it's really just showing that we've got an amazing engine that's growing in size almost um, every minute of the day at the moment and, and really is there for tapping into to, to gain the insight so that we can take this whole grazing thing a lot further. So stepping back a little bit, <clears throat> the bits that matter, um, and it might be obvious, might not to different people on the call. <clears throat> and it's, it's certainly the case that soil fertility is going to have a big role in this and we have included soil P in, uh, in some of our studies. But the, the big ones are obviously rainfall, which we can't control, 
But the other three that I'll just put up here because we've really been looking pretty hard at this is the interplay between recovery, doc, stock density and stocking rate. <clears throat> so recovery being the, uh, the amount of time that a pasture paddock is, is given to rest before it's been grazed again. Stock density is the, the, uh, the number of mouths on the paddock at a point in time, whether they're DSE or livestock units or animal units in the States <clears throat> or elsewhere whether it's measured in pounds or kilos or any other measure, it's all about what is the pressure on that area of land or that square metre at that point in time. Because we could you know, obviously vary that a hell of a lot and we do and we see that through the numbers. And ultimately uh, it's all about stocking rate and managing stocking rate with those other levers so that we're optimising the harvesting of grass, not just at a point in time, but over periods of time, whether it's days, months, weeks, or years, <clears throat> or lifetimes, in fact. So when we actually go and pull those numbers apart, put them back together with um, tens of thousands of rows, we find that there's actually uh, something pretty interesting happening. <clears throat> so we've actually found that in our data set, uh, if we pull it apart, put it back together, there actually is a strong data model that we can build and we're, we've only just really got our teeth into this and we're gonna take this a lot further, but uh, these variables are so important that we can actually build a predictive model. <clears throat> and the predictive model will basically say the, the actual annual dry matter production and consumption per hectare is predictable based on rainfall, recovery, and stock density, which might seem a little bit staggering, but it's it's actually what's coming through with some pretty strong numbers in our modeling. <clears throat> and it's excluding soil P, although our, our modeling is going to grow into soil phosphorus and uh, other soil factors. But uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing that um, those simple variables are actually so demonstrably important to grass yield and it makes sense and I guess we you know a lot of people are going to be intuitively saying that that makes sense but it's probably never been um, pulled apart and put back together to the extent that we can now do because of the, the grazed data that we've accrued over time uh, we looked at a bunch of other things including um, sort of sand silt clay water holding capacities and so on so that's a big subject that uh, that's going to be ongoing and I'm, I'm glad we got our teeth into it so <laughs> what's the problem? I, I think it's worth stopping and saying, right, oh, um, that's great, but what is the problem that we're trying to address here? And from our perspective, it's really critical that we're, that we're aware of this <clears throat> and focused on it, because if we're not really clear on what the problem is, we're not gonna get there. And there are so many dollars tied up in, in the farm and the enterprise, structures around grazing at the moment that it's just absolutely critical particularly in tough times like uh, eastern australia is going through and western australia for that matter um, it's really critical that we understand what the problem is and you know the obvious one is definitely rainfall variability and i could put up a bunch of slides that i'm not going to that um, that would point at really extreme variability in in rainfall patterns uh, all over the place not just in australia but certainly in australia this last um, recent years and that's something we can't control though. We can only manage for it. So the second problem that we see really is that, that whilst there are billions of dollars tied up in stock, fences, paddocks, pastures, chemical, and all the rest of it, there are not really good feedback loops on your farm linking your results back to the actions that you took to achieve them. And that's really what this is all about, trying to work out uh, what's working, what's not, doing more of what's working and, and pulling up on the stuff that's not. And as Jack Sparrow so eloquently put, you know, we've really got to start looking at how we think about these problems and, and not, not being a victim of them, really just uh, getting in control. And, and at the end of the day, that means data and that means having tools that accrue that data and do more with it. So um, with that in mind, uh, I'll throw now to some, some of the data that popped up from our, uh, Lovely volunteers. There's a bunch of it. There was there was just so much of it. I was drowning in it, and uh, there were 
threads everywhere. And this is just a very small snapshot of the kind of numbers that were coming through. And it's, it's a bit of everything. And uh, it really did help me appreciate the, the difference between beef and, and wool production systems and the data that flows into them and the data that flows out of them. And whilst I was swimming in a sea of numbers, I essentially came to the conclusion that we uh, needed to, in, at least in this first um, data dive, take a, a longitudinal look through one property and, and really go through that from a, um, a first principles point of view because there's a year's worth of work just pulling back on, on the numbers that are in front of us there and linking that back to the mob and then the paddock and the various things that have happened in the paddock. So to all of those people that have volunteered that data, greatly appreciated and uh, let's just see what we can do with that sort of stuff. So to Kevin, uh, and I found this lovely little snapshot of a, of a book, 37 bucks. It'll, it's uh, under the tree at Christmas, I've discovered. It's a recently published book. And uh, it's just happenstance that Kevin is a fantastic example of the wool production system in Australia. It's got a great history. And the reason that I chose it to do our data dive today is that basically it's got one of the best grazing data sets, I think, in the country. Uh, and we've got it in Maya. Uh, plenty of DC, plenty of hectares, 10,000 discrete actual events around those animals and paddocks and movements and people, a bunch of mobs, uh, just a heap of different moving parts and cogs in the machine that, um, that is a full-scale wool production system. Uh, as I say, there's 11 people doing the doing, although I think some of those people might argue that some do more doing than other doing, but uh, it's, it's a really good property and a really easy group of people to work with and collaborate with, which is why I've chosen it. And that's, uh, that's where we're going to dive into now. So and I should say, actually, where's Kevin? Kevin is uh, down uh, in the, in the southern, southern New South Wales on the Murrumbidgee and uh, probably an hour and a half or so from Canberra. Uh, got a long colonial past and a lot of history in, in the wool production system. So, Kevin, why did I choose it? As I've just said, because of all those points just now. The, the fundamental one is that it's, it's the best example I could find in all of the, the data that I could gather up in the time that I had to, to see what was and what is, what changed over time, where there was a feedback loop between the weather, the data tool, the grazing movements, the people, and ultimately into the wool. And whilst that might sound pretty simple, I'm here to tell you that it really uh, is not, and there are not very many good examples of that that I've been able to find uh, either in the literature or, or elsewhere. And so we're very fortunate to have that, that relationship. And, and the key thing here is that we've got a really good solid set of grazing data that, uh, that runs from 2015 through to present and charts some changes over time. So it does make it a, a beautiful data set. And the key thing here is, I think, that, um, that we've actually got a, a feedback loop that is so critical to then looking at the outcomes from, from actions. So swinging into a couple of things there, just to just to uh, fire through what what's been happening at Cavern, and and I, I will say, this could be replicated on a whole bunch of properties around Australia and the world. It's uh, it's not unique to Cavern, but it is a really good embodiment of change in management practices over time. So here we've got uh, a snapshot. We had 58 paddocks that became 118 over three years the recent three years that's in this data set, which covers about 3,000 hectares. So it's a pretty good hard go at um, breaking big paddocks up into smaller paddocks. And, you know, we can, we can labour the, 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 the benefits or otherwise of, and, and what for and reasons for why people would break big paddocks up into little paddocks. But ultimately it's about getting control over who's eating what and when. And uh, we're really just going to focus on what the outcomes of that are at the moment. So that's what we've got here. 58 packs that become 118 with a load of data that's within them. 
and in terms of how I did what I did that I'm about to show you, it's really not too difficult. So we've got we've got a load of, of Gray's history, multiple moves, so many so many different stock classes within so many different mobs on different I mean, basically every single day of that period of time, we know where every animal was, what they ate, and who was doing what. And for those paddocks that were subdivided, we've got the, this great fortune of, of being able to say, okay, let's go and gather up the, uh, the grass shield before it was subdivided and the grass shield after it was subdivided, clean it up, exclude the paddocks that don't have enough history uh, or that were just laneways or that were, you know, anomalies. and uh, normalize that yield, that grass yield for rainfall, which a lot of people aren't going to do, but I'm here to tell you it's it's a pretty critical part of the deal because if we have dry years and then wet years, we can't compare apples and oranges. We've got to be able to say, right, the yield is based on uh, a millimetre of rain or in this case, 100 mils of rain. And you'd say, well, why do we choose 100 mil of rain? Well, it's four inches and it's easy to uh, convert to numbers that you might be more familiar with. So. If you've got a 600 mil rainfall, it's time six. And it's a beautifully simple thing to do. So that's what I did. And uh, the numbers for Cavan, and again, there's nothing crazy different about what Cavan are doing here. They're, they're getting larger chunks of country and getting control over who's eating what and when with um, this concept of subdivision. And the numbers are that uh, those paddocks were on average 87 hectares and after being split up and what I found in the data set, they ended up being 26 hectare on average. So obviously there's some bigger than that, some smaller than that, but basically uh, a 70% reduction in paddock size over approximately a third of the farm. So it's no trivial undertaking. Absolutely um, credit to them for having a crap. So density starting to get interesting. So 12 DSC per hectare per day in the data set prior to subdivision per paddock. So every graze of every, every day of every graze of every paddock was looked at here. And the result is that on average, 12 DSC per hectare per day, that's the density at a point in time. And that then shifted out to 42, which I know a lot of, uh, uh, you know, real grazing proficionados will say is, is not high enough, but it's a progression. It's on, it's, it's on its way to wherever it's going. And what is ideal for individual animal performance versus herd performance, flock performance, uh, you know, is another discussion in itself. But ultimately, for Cavan, the result has been a shift from 12 to 42 DEC per hectare per day. Whether that that's for one day or 50 days is, is another matter, but that's that's the actual pressure in terms of mouths on square metres for all of those grazers. And it's a pretty impressionable increase, right? Um, 250%. So ultimately that means that the, uh, the country's not, there's, there's then a, an appreciable ability to increase the recovery period with that change in density. The duration, again, this is, this is averaged over a hell of a lot. So you can imagine that um, it's a pretty broad number, but it's still a, a very valid assessment to say, right, I, the average prior to subdivision was 40 days per graze. And afterwards it was down to 17. So that's taking uh, a, a sweep through all grazes of all time. And it's not differentiating between lambing, carving, uh, joining or anything else, which in itself would be another uh, pleasurable few days of um, data diving to, to pull that apart, I think. But it's, it's, it's including those periods of time when there will be longer duration anyway. So that being said, it just means that um, there is an appreciable shift in the duration of grazers. And that's come about because of that shift in density, which has come about from the shift in paddock area. Uh, and we were looking at there through the prism of a graze chart. So paddocks on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And here we've got, uh, you know, it looks like a bit of lambing, set stocking, one mob over multiple paddocks through to um, the movement of 
um, a mob through various paddocks here in different configurations, which is um, really what comes about from getting that control over the grazing that variable. So now to the money, now to the, uh, the interesting part, the bit that really um, took my interest. That's the yield. And I had to do this a number of times because I didn't actually know whether to believe it. So uh, the result was pretty good. The actual grass consumed, the actual yield harvested per 100 mils of rain over that period of time has gone from 220 kilos per hectare per 100 mil to 369. And I don't think the decimal points really matter here because this is the average of all paddocks over that period of time. <clears throat> and uh, it took quite a bit of time to work that through and double check it a number of times. But basically, uh, that's an appreciable increase. It's in line with the kind of anecdotal gains that, that people will talk about in terms of increasing grazing control through um, temporary fences. Uh, you know, I've, I've often heard of uh, up to 100% increase in stocking rate as a result, but never really been able to get into the data to have a look at it. And this data set allowed us to, to flow that through. And it's it's pretty solid. Um, it's it's certainly solid enough. Uh, and then the, in terms of a, of a quantum, it's 149 kilos, let's call it 150 kilos per hectare per 100 mils. And we'll follow that through shortly. But the key point here is that that's, uh, that's normalized for rainfall every day of every graze throughout that period of time, the relationship between uh, the mob, the paddock, the moves, the area, the grass consumed, when it last rained, when it next rained, all of that's included in this. So uh, I'll, I'll keep moving, but um, that's a key number that really does um, raise the eyebrows a little bit. And we've got to then think about what that results in down the road, but um, as a starting point, I think I'd I think I'd take that quite happily. <clears throat> I'll be interested in what um, what various people think about that as a as a realistic number or not too. So, what did it cost? Now, I look at this quite a bit across different farms in different countries, and it ranges a hell of a lot. I, I think the lowest I've seen is about fifteen bucks a hectare, up to two hundred plus dollars a hectare, and I've come to the conclusion. That it really, um, you know, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I think it actually comes back to <coughs> our fence pride and our, um, our ego tends to be wound up in a fence a lot of the time. And uh, it's a pretty key point because if, if we start to look at the return on investment from getting control over grazing management and not viewing it as a cost of needing to put water and wire up, but actually looking at it as a, an investable, it makes you think, right, do I really need to? Put the concrete in versus the uh, the more temporary version or, or whatever, and that's a story in itself. And, and I think um, there are no judgments or or black and whites in this. It's a, it's a range. It's a process between development of large tracts of land that might need totally permanent uh, fencing for for um, boisterous animals versus single wire or double wire temporary fences uh, that that are a fraction of the cost. Uh, and I'm not here to judge that. All I'm here to do is say this is what was actually spent for cabin through this study, and it's a, it's about right. It's about average um, in terms of permanent, semi-permanent water and wire, and a range thereof. And uh, and on this property, you know, there's been over 3,000 hectares of it put up, which means that um, there's going to be a real range. But it's uh, it's an interesting proposition then to think about what's that worth because we've got to then think about the return on investment. And whilst it probably only interests people like me, I thought about it, if the country down there is worth 250, sorry, 2,500 an acre, then that $88 a hectare buys me about 140 square metres, which isn't a great deal. And then I had thought about it a bit further and I thought, well, I'm paying around about $1,000 a DSE area in that country because it's, good, dependable country. It's got all sorts of various things going on, which mean that it sits around that thousand bucks a DC area. But based on these numbers, 
it's telling me that I can fence it for ninety dollars a DSC area, which really does um, change some of the equations around whether I'm buying better off buying next door or getting my own place under control first, and then thinking about the split of overhead and the, the return on capital. And that's a really big, interesting conversation, I think. And uh, again, not here to judge it either way, but I think the more numbers that we can flush out about our own production systems, the more likely we are to make better decisions and, and leverage it. And that's back to my first point about the problem with um, a lot of farms at the moment is that we, we don't have that feedback loop that says, this is my data for my farm, this is working, this is the return on investment, I'm going to keep doing it, or the alternative, and I'm, I'm not going to keep doing it. So uh, I've just put this in because, you know, I, I see so many variations in, in subdivision configurations and spend, and it just has to work. It doesn't need to be a testament to how good we are at building fences. It just needs to work. And it just means holding animals where we want to hold them. And obviously there's differences between the top of class that we're talking about here, but that's the critical thing. And, we, and we've got to start seeing it as an investable, which means we're going to start getting a bit more disciplined about how we spend that uh, capital. So rocking along because I love to, and uh, I'm trusting that um, I'm going to notice if people are putting up their hands and there's a bunch of questions, but we'll just keep going in the meantime. Um, where does this take us? What does it mean? Where's the value? So this starts to get interesting. And this is really where I wanted to get to uh, because we have got this, this, this great data set. So this is just looking through Kevin, through that Gray's history. And, and what I've done here is to get the DC per hectare, stocking rate per hectare for all enterprises, break that down then to just the wool because there are multiple enterprises. It's a bit of a beast is, is Kevin between um, stud, commercial, crossbred, dual purpose, beef, it goes on. Uh, it's pretty important then to say, right, I will, what's the, what's the stocking rate just for the wool job? Uh, which I've done here in the second column over those years. And you can see there's variation, which will make sense when you see the rainfall. And then I've normalized that for the rainfall that was over that period of time. And that, that evens it out a little bit. Uh, again, nothing too exciting. Uh, the rainfall is in our fourth column, showing a pretty hairy kind of ride, but then most of um, Australia's had a hairy kind of ride for the last uh, few years. But 600s up to 850 mils in 16, 17 year, back down into the 400s and perhaps even lower at the moment, I fear. Um, and a, a, another point of note here before I move on is that um, the kilos per head of wool in the year following that wet year certainly did seem to, to drop away, which um, has, has been pointed out in plenty of other places as well. So, Moving on, I think the kilos per head, interesting, but that's not where the money is at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of discussion in various literature around these numbers. And ultimately, the one that, that matters to me is the, the kilos of wool per hectare per mill of rain. It's the true arbiter of whether or not we're going in the right direction. And uh, I've also just put up the average rainfalls up here just to give you a sense of the fact that right now is pretty terrible long-term average of 730 mils and over this period of time the average was 620. So um, I'll put this into a chart in a sec but the wool per kilo, kilos of wool per hectare per hundred mil has uh, has been going okay. There's actually a pretty strong trend of increase through that period of time and I'm not able to pull apart the contributing factor from genetics, um, you know, stock handling. There's a bunch of different numbers that are going to be contributing to that trend. So ultimately, if I own this place, I'm happy to see that trend go up. It warrants a lot more discussion and investigation as to what the real drivers of that are. But the biggest changes over that period of time have been in grazing management. And 
it's a pretty solid shift and it's a it's a it's a good trend <laughs> let's put it that way so if we're if we're increasing our grazing control getting a better handle on the recovery the density and the stocking rate through various management practices which i know firsthand that cabin have really put a lot of time and energy into and fundamentally driven by those numbers around uh, breaking big paddocks up then uh, it's pretty interesting that we're not seeing a, a drop off in wool or a drop off in wool per head it's actually uh, looking pretty good and i will note that um that drop off in the middle 2016-17 there is a pretty good reason for that which we'll see in a minute uh, and will be uh, a bit more obvious but just back to the wool one kilogram per hectare 100 mil of wool difference over that period of time you can you can slice and dice that in any number of ways but if you just said right oh it's been about 600 mils for the last five years let's just apply that that's um that's 90 dollars a hectare at 15 bucks a kilo for wool and obviously that's a pretty sweet spot for wool price at the moment, but um, there you've, you've paid off your fence already. And future gains are in the bank without any cost. And obviously this is just one on farm, but um, I have done this on, on other properties now and, and it, 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 stands, it stands up. It's, uh, it's a pretty solid return on investment. And obviously wool is gonna give a better return on investment than than beef or just about anything else at the moment because of the position it was in. But um, I thought that was pretty pretty darn good. So if we convert that uh, that gain in grass to dollars, I've just done it two ways here and said, righto, um, I don't have the benefit necessarily of, of all my grass going to wool. Let's just put it through a sheep enterprise, whatever that might be, some wool, some whatever. And I converted that 150 kilos per hectare, 100 mil that came from our yield analysis and, uh, and just put an arbitrary 25 bucks a DSC gross margin on it. Then, you know, I'm, I'm a, I've paid around two thirds of the cost of the fence and, and water and wire um, straight up. That's just looking at through a pretty broad generic um, sheep enterprise. If I look at it just through wool, which are pretty rose colored glasses at the moment, um, 15 bucks a kilo, 600 mils per hectare, so 600 mils rainfall a year, which is certainly well below average. Still looking at $90 a hectare gain over that period of time. So we're in the realms of, you know, 50% plus return on investment from getting better control over that grazing management, which is pretty handy. Now, wool prices, um, we've just been talking about, uh, I thought it would be a nice, another way of looking at things that you're probably not familiar with and really most people just don't think of it because they can't get this data. But if we look at it through the actual outcome of feed conversion, we can put a value on the grass. And so I went through the literature and, and really struggled to find a good coherent number on clean production of wool from grass. You know, what's the feed conversion ratio for grass in the wool? And, uh, and couldn't really find one that um, seemed agreeable or consistent. Whereas in beef, it's quite, quite well mapped out. And uh, I thought, right, well, let's, let's turn it back the other way and say, right, we know how much grass was eaten on cabin over the period of time that produced X many kilos of wool because we have the wool numbers. What's the grass worth that went into it? And... It's actually higher than this because this doesn't fully account for the fact that um, there's the, uh, the, the, the weight gain, the, the meat production out of the wool job as well. But basically it's um, quite conservatively tripled the value of giving that same grass to a beef enterprise at the moment, which really does put the wood on us to, to extract that opportunity. And I'm sure many of you actually are doing that right now, but that's a pretty telling, Pretty telling number and one I don't know that um, too many people uh, are thinking about when they're looking at who they're feeding what and how they're measuring their return on investment and that that's a number that we can then pull out and start to do more with when it comes to 
assessing return on investment from fertiliser or seed or chemical or water and wire, as we've talked about. So that's pretty cool. So running on now and let me look at the, at the environment that this was achieved in. Uh, it's been pretty tough. 11 months, actually before I get to that, I'll just say, right, we've gone from 858 mils rolling annual rainfall back in Hellison days of 2017 to something just under 400 mils now. Uh, we've got November there, but December's about the same. So it's been, a, it's been quite a slow, steady, incremental fall over that period of time. And so I, and I put that up because it really does, um, you know, it, it's a pat on the back for cabin management that they've been able to manage that um, that set of numbers through that period of time in a consistently falling rainfall pattern, which explains the blip in the 16, 17 wool numbers. Well, I think it does anyway. Um, we might get into an argument about that, but I'm running the show at the moment, so I get to say what I think. And I, I think that um, when when I look at these numbers, what this is really saying is that there was a pretty pretty stiff uptick uptick in the uh, the accrued rainfall through 1617, and essentially the stocking rate wasn't wasn't uh, able to be grown quickly enough to take advantage of that. Whether that's a confidence issue or a capital issue or a um, access issue, it doesn't really matter. At, at the end of the day, that's that's what that is about. That uh, the the stocking rate was diluted on a per hundred mil basis through that wetter year, and therefore um, the wool was as well. And uh, the other point I was going to make there is that it's it's crazy but true that only eleven of the eighty three months in that period of time were at or above average rainfall. So that's a pretty telling number. It's, uh, it's a pretty tough environment to try and make money out of. And it's definitely going to test management systems, which means people. So, so I love this chart. This is, uh, this is the money shot for, for this business because I've, I've looked at this kind of a chart for a lot of different companies around the world and not everyone gets it singing as sweetly as this. And what, what, the, what we're looking at here is the actual stocking rate in green to the ideal stocking rate, which is the carrying capacity in the dashed um, turquoise line. So the example there is that in May 2017, the, um, the potential stocking rate was running at 8.2 DC per hectare, but the actual was running at 5.7, which was that, that wetter period. Where, because you know, the, I guess it, it takes time to stock up. It's it's not a magic wand. All of these things need management. And when you're running forty to fifty thousand days, so you can't you can't get stuff done with a click of the fingers like you might want to, or uh, imagine you can. But it's it's a it's a process. And so the real the really important thing about this chart is the gap between those two lines. And I love it. I, I think that's that's um, it's poetry in motion because we've got a decreasing um, variance between those two lines going from the early period when there was a bit of overstocking, then some understocking, then some overstocking, then some understocking, which happens every day of the week on every farm around Australia and other other continents. I've got to tell you, I see the numbers. And this is the type of trend that we want to see, whether it's wool beef or anything else for that matter, but certainly, certainly in wool production, given the margins on the table. And the, the importance of having sufficient feed on hand to have choices about who's going to eat what so that we can maintain nutrition flows at plane of nutrition and get on top of um, all the variables that go into quality. So, so that's a real win. And I, and I think that whilst it's, it's not able to be said that it, there's a causal factor there between any one thing, that's good management, pure and simple whether it's come from getting a handle on recovery and density and stocking rate per graze, per day, per month, per set of paddocks 
you know, I think that's definitely going to have an impact. But um, at a property level, this means that through that period of time, there's been more choices. There's been less exposure to um, rising feed costs, less exposure to um, quality issues to do with breaks in plant of nutrition. Uh, and really fundamentally important too is the fact that the state of the ecology is going to be better than were it otherwise where uh, stocking rate of carrying capacity is not being matched or improved and the consummate um, impact that's going to have on on uh, grass responsiveness when ch when seasons do change. So that's a pretty good um, summary of of the position of this enterprise over that period of time and it, and it really just validates those other numbers back along the way. So I'll, I'll round that out with just pulling that back to a, a bigger picture. You know, what's the benefit of that? And this is looking across um, our whole data set, not just wool, and mapping the relationship between total grass yield and the bit and the, and the, the ability of the property to manage stocking rate to carrying capacity, which is what we were just looking at before. And there's a, an inverse relationship there where the better the control over stocking rate to carrying capacity, the higher the ultimate yield on a per hectare basis is and per 100 mils. So that's pretty interesting. So I'm, uh, I'm going to wrap up and, uh, and uh, introduce Will Rag, not to be confused with Will I Am, too often with his singing abilities, uh, just to talk about what he sees on the ground at Cavan because he's, he's one of the guys that does the doing and, uh, and drives that system of animal movement around and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, no, it's no small thing. And I'll just finish by, by saying that those, have, those of you that haven't seen Maya, that's what this is about. We, we, we have an engine here that has been built to get control over grazing management and those variables that are so implicit to the allocation of feed and making sure that we, we best marry up stocking rate to count capacity, not just at a point in time, but over a period of time. That's what we're about. And providing that feedback loop back to the people that um, own and run the property so that we're not leaving money on the table when it comes to the big decisions, because ultimately it is about making decisions. So. Um, I'll throw to Will, and just because I can, I'm just going to quickly um, make the point that uh, it's not that hard. Now, we're, we're talking here about the data that just came, that, that came or flowed into the review that we just did, came from keeping on top of stock numbers, keeping on top of mobs, and moving them around and tracking that. Yes, there's rainfall. Yes, there's um, daily demand, dry matter intake numbers that we have to keep on top of but we're doing that most of the time anyway and yeah we need to keep on top of um, stock numbers as a whole but it's it really is as simple as um, allowing that data to flow through in a way that we can then marry up and get those numbers that um, that I worked through there before and I just love looking at that it's just so nice and simple so enough from me um, although I am more than happy to take questions as we go here um, so, so I end with my contribution to the to the first data dive for uh, uh, Maya and, and Marina Link. Um, I'll open up now and just will. Uh, I'd love to get your perspective on what we've just looked at there because I've made it all sound pretty easy. I'm the guy with computer hands. I'm not the one actually doing any doing anymore. Um, from your perspective, as stockman and and uh, general rouse about and doer of the things that make a difference to everyone else. What, uh, what reflections would you have on what we've just been running through there in terms of practicalities of it all, the theory of it all, the difficulty of it all, or anything else for that matter? And then we'll throw out to the audience for questions. If you just, um, yeah. there, there we go. Great. Yeah, so I've got uh, Tom Deary here as well. So he can answer any questions. But uh, yeah, that was, that was a good presentation. That, uh, it was very interesting to see uh, how, yeah, the ability that we were to change our grazing 
just by splitting paddocks and that sort of stuff because we hadn't seen that presentation, so that was good. Um, yeah, and I thought the the graph of the stock and rate to carrying capacity that was very interesting as well. So, Will, when it comes to you know, the, so thank you, that's great. I appreciate that. It, it's um, it it's good. I think it's a, it's a great data set. You guys are the ones moving these uh, animals around, keeping on top of their needs, allocating feed to them, planning out who gets what and when. Um, that's no mean feat on any property, let alone a, a big beast. How how does that relate to your view of time, change over time and, and actually just what you're seeing out in the paddock? Hey. But Tom here, Tom here with, here with Will. Um, Go Tom. Yeah, we, we, we very much, watching that presentation, um, we, we do get bogged down in the operations, I must say. <laughs> so I, it was, I found the presentation very interesting. Look, we're, my take on it, I mean, I, I've had a bit to do with uh, <clears throat> learning about grazing management before I came to Cavan, and I was convinced that there was a lot in grazing management and the ability to contribute to business profitability, medium and long term. Um, now, you know, so um, using Maya, which, as I just said, we've been very much focused on just putting the data in um, and, and possibly not taking the time to reflect on the data that you just showed us. But I think, um, yeah, implementing the grazing management and and, um, and being conscious of it, and then looking at paddocks, say making a, a you know a very intense graze and, and a short graze, and then and then being aware of that, and then looking at that paddock um, just in from our observations, uh, it it just uh, confirms that there is a lot to be done through grazing management, yeah. Okay, so anything there that doesn't ring true? Um, anything that uh, makes you feel like, you know, that's not quite how I'm seeing it out in the paddock? I mean, given that it is the case now that you're running on um, around about 400 mils of rain for the year versus uh, those previous years. Yeah, look, we're, we're not immune to drought, even though we've implemented grazing management. Um, so look, we're... I drive around just at the moment, but and and I think, oh, we, we we could do a bit better than this. That's just my personal opinion. Um, so, but I, I still think um, that my is uh, is um, you know the data we see through my coupled with our observations, it all links true. What you've got there is some you've used big data. Um, uh, we, we still need to improve our consistency of our data entry to be able to further confirm things uh, on a paddock by paddock basis. Um, but overall, you know, like the, the presentation you gave is the big picture and overall the big picture, it all makes sense to me. I don't know what, what Will thinks, but it, it, all, um, it all rings true. What, one thing, sorry, I will say that we, we noted when we went through was um, we are doing a lot of feeding at the moment, um, so I just wanted to ask what, you know, in your, your figures there, did you include uh, feeding in those figures? Yeah, no, good point. So, so the, those figures exclude any ad, substitution feeding for dry matter that goes into um, a ewe or a stud or whatever to maintain nutrition. So those numbers are grass consumed, not prime matter and and that's an important distinction and it's it's a good one to to flush out so there is a significant difference between supplementary feeding and substitution feeding that really does need to be brought out into the open and and a good conversation had about it because um, yeah, fundamentally all of these stocking rate calculations have to exclude um, the, any substitution feeding which means hay or fodder that's not not from the paddock which is very different to supplementary feeding which is all about a bypass protein or you know as an example for actually increasing and maintaining 
the um, daily intake of an animal on feed that may not be ideal, which uh, which is not substitution feeding. So the calculations in, for the, all those stocking rate numbers are definitely on a on a grass consumed basis, and yeah. uh, and ultimately, you know, that the the goal of that is to reduce the the um, the exposure to feed costs, but it, there's there's no there's no doubt. I mean, the, the the if I go back to the um, this chart here, for example, uh, the the answer isn't, and it's it's good to flush this out. The answer isn't sell everything, buy everything, sell everything, buy everything, because that's not practical, particularly not when you've got a lot invested in genetics, as Kevin has, and so many other um, wool production systems, and beef for that matter. It's about knowing how close to the line we are so that we can make an informed decision about how we're going to fill a feed gap, when we're going to do that, what's the best return on doing that versus being blind, reacting too late, paying 500 bucks a tonne for, for pellets or, or, um, or hay or whatever that doesn't actually return anything because it's just meeting maintenance and we're not sure about what the numbers are and we don't know what the return is. So big difference in, the, in, that, in that approach. And even if we do have to feed, because we make the financial decision that it's worth keeping these stock to take them through to a value point that makes it worthwhile, knowing our position relative to that with the grass that we've got and how long it's going to last us is critical to making that decision. So, yeah, good point. Um, good eye. Well, thanks, um, Tom. Thanks, Will. Uh, you guys are uh, definitely... Um, much appreciate your input there. And, you know, I guess every, every farm has its own nuances. It just happens that Kevin's got a, you know, a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a big set of moving parts that means that it will basically flush out issues as they arise compared to a simpler, smaller property. And you, there's nowhere to hide. You get it wrong, it shows up. You get it right, it, it falls out the bottom. So appreciate your input there fellas um and uh dave i might throw back to you and yep and yeah sure uh, so we've got a yeah we've got a few more questions um this one's for will um so how much time uh does all this cost uh cost you and is it worth it uh, so uh originally it cost a bit just to get all the data in like mobs and paddocks and all that sizes and everything like that but once you get all that set up it's pretty quick that you can use the app on your phone um, you've just got to put in your dry matter sort of uh, estimations and stuff as you move the mob so you can do it on the go which is pretty good and then we've because we've been able to keep on top of all that we've been able to do forecasts to sort of forecast as we're going so we've been able to make some decisions early, which have made a big difference in our business uh, to be able to de-stock or buy stock sort of thing. So it initially, it takes quite a bit to get it all in, but like ongoing, it's quite good. It okay. is worth it. <laughs> Great. Uh, there's another one here, Will. Um, this one is, uh, what do you get out of all this if compared to the property owner? It's from Jason. What was that? Sorry. Uh, it's uh, what do you get out of all this uh, if compared to the property owner? Uh, so for us, like we're, we've actually been able to estimate because Maya gives you uh, a better indication of the amount of grass you're getting out of the paddock as you're moving them. It's helped us to calibrate ourselves on our uh, pasture estimations on the go, especially with lucin. We found we were overestimating the amount of lucin we had in our paddocks. And then when we actually took the sheep out of the paddock, that was, uh, yeah, different to what we'd thought. So that was the biggest thing we found sort of on the ground for that, uh, rather than sort of the bigger decisions are more for the owners and that sort of stuff. So the buying and selling sort of thing. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I will just say that's a really good answer, Will, because, um, and I'm not just saying that, because this is about calibration. This is about people. This is about paddocks and grass and day-to-day. -day. It's not a machine. It's not a, it's not a robot. It's actually 
people and animals. These are these are all things that change all the time, and the grass obviously is changing all the time. And our appreciation of how much grass that thing over there is is uh, is a calibration. And it goes back to that earlier point that this is really all about us as graziers trying to build a, a feedback loop that we can just get the hang of and not feel like we don't know what we're doing. That's that's really what this comes down to. So thanks, Will. That was good. All right, great. I think we'll just uh, wrap it up there. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, that was great. If you would like to find out a bit more information about Marie Anne Link and my grazing, the details are just on the screen there. Feel free to visit our website, follow us on social media. We'll let you know of any upcoming webinars and events through our different channels. Also, if you want to arrange a consultation, one of our salespeople to give you a run through of my grazing, the details are there as well. Thanks again. Thanks, Bart, Will, Tom. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, wrap that up.